Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the seventh edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting and apologies for our bit of a hiatus over the last uh, two or three weeks but with um, June 30 financial year end and companies going into blackout and in advance of poor C reporting and uh, We've had a we've had a bit of, bit of a lull, but we're going to rectify that this morning. We've got two very interesting companies here with us, and we'll hopefully be back onto our normal fortnightly cycle from now on, and probably a bit, maybe even weekly uh, through reporting season. But I will let you all know uh, well in advance that we are going to move to weekly uh, morning meetings uh, throughout reporting season. To go through a couple of introductory slides and some housekeeping for anybody who's joining us for the first time. So my name's Mark Tobin, I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps and I would like to welcome you to this, our seventh edition now of the, the morning meeting series which we kicked off back in um, April. Uh, the structure of the webinars, we generally run them every fortnight and uh, it's plus minus an hour where we have two companies with a 30 minute slot, which is going to be broken down into a 20 minute presentation. Then we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box uh, down below. Please don't type them in the, in the chat function. Uh, the Q&A box uh, just allows me to maybe get back to some of them uh, live as our presenters are talking. And if not, we'll, we'll try and get to them when we come to the Q&A section at the end of the presenter's presentation. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably uh, sometime on Friday or if not it'll be latest um, end of day Monday. So if you miss something, if uh, one of the presenters skips over a slide a little bit too quickly, you will be able to go back and, and re-watch it at a little over the weekend or if not early next week and um, if you don't follow us on our various social media channels uh, please do so twitter is where i'm most active and it's at c microcaps so no coffee uh, as i said youtube for the recording of this webinar you can also go look at the previous six webinars and there's going to be more content coming onto the youtube channel uh, over the next three to four months. Uh, LinkedIn for some more additional long form content that I do where I'm not restricted by the 240 characters on Twitter. I recently just published a microcap fund review where we looked at the performance of you know the 30 odd microcap funds in Australia and I also run a subscription newsletter focused on ASX microcap stocks. It's via the Substack platform. If you just google that you'll be able to find me on there. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two presenters for today. First up, we're going to have Mr. Jeff Pocock, the CEO of Osteopower, and he's going to be followed by Dr. Ben Cole, the CEO of Wide Open Agriculture. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our first presenter, Jeff. Jeff, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now, and then you can start yours, and I'll let you know when we can see the cover slide of your presentation. Okay. I can see the cover okay. slide now, Jeff. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Well, look, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction and the, for the opportunity to, to present. And, and thank you, everyone, for your, uh, for your time this morning. Um, I'd like to go through a little bit of the, the story of osteopore, the technology, and what it is that we're doing in 3D printed bioresorbable implants for regenerative bone healing. So, as I make my screen move forward. So a quick snapshot of, of Osteopore. Osteopore is a, an Australian Singaporean company. So the company is obviously listed on ASX, but our operations are based out of Singapore. And the technology was developed over a period of some 20 years of research through key uh, top leading Singaporean uh, research institutions, uh, universities and hospitals. And the technology being developed and uh, commercialized by Osteopore is 3D printed bioresorbable implants for regenerative bone healing. And if we unpack all of the different parts of that, we look at the, the different components all have relevance. The 3D printing 
These products are produced by 3D printing technology. That 3D printing technology gives the product a range of uh, therapeutic and operational advantages. There are certain things that we can do in 3D printing involving creating extremely fine microstructured um, uh, implants that are designed and optimised to ensure the, uh, the capacity of regenerative bone healing. There's also a number of commercial advantages associated with 3D printing. We'll talk about that when, in, in a bit more detail when we look at the company's business model as being a manufacturer. But the key of what we're doing is it is all about regenerative medicine. And what regenerative medicine means is we're using the powers that the body has to generate, to regenerate its own tissue and to grow its own tissue. So the, um, the, the key to the, uh, the, the osteopore technology is we are helping patients regrow their own bone. Now, bone is naturally a very regenerative tissue. If you break your arm or break a bone, the doctors will put it in place, put the pieces in place, and the bones will naturally knit together. That is, they will regrow and regenerate natural bone in order to, to create a whole uh, new bone um, that has all the structural integrity of the original, which is what one of the reasons why this bone is a fantastic tissue for the sort of technology that uh, osteopore is developing. But what bone won't do, whilst it wants to regenerate, it won't regenerate across a void. If a piece of bone has been removed or damaged, um, possibly due to trauma, maybe a traffic accident or due to surgery, or even due to an infection or cancer, if a piece of bone has been removed, the body won't regenerate that bone across that void. And this is where the osteopore scaffold comes into play. The osteopore scaffold is a, is, a, is a medical device that sits in that void created by the removal of bone, but creates an environment where the body can then naturally regrow that bone to bridge that gap. And it does that using this biomimetic structure that is in place that enables the body to regrow blood vessels through the, um, through the structure. So the, the structure has to be microporous, has to be completely porous so that things can go through the structure in every direction. But at the same time, have the sort of scope, um, structures in place that, in, um, that promote and assist the bone to regrow. And the other key thing about the osteopore scaffold is the concept of bioresorption. So the scaffold is made out of a polymer called polycaprolactone. This is a polymer that's uh, widely used in medical uh, procedures. It's used for uh, dissolvable stitches used by surgeons um, for suturing and for uh, stitching things up internally. And what happens is under biological conditions in the body, polycaprolactone naturally resorbs and dissolves to just generate carbon dioxide and water. And that means that the osteopore scaffold over a period of some 12 to 24 months after it's been inserted into the body gradually dissolves until there is no scaffold left behind and all the patient has is their own natural bone in place. So the patient having gone from a situation where a piece of bone has been removed and the body cannot regenerate across that void can then regenerate that bone across the void and at the same time, the scaffold that enables that gradually resolves to leave nothing behind but the patient's own natural bone. This is a massive therapeutic advantage on a few different fronts. Most particularly, it provides massive um, inc increased uh, or, or decreased rates of complications for, surgeon, for surgery and uh, for, for the regenerative for the patient itself. So that's the, the core of the product. We're creating these dissolvable scaffolds that will then provide an environment for the body to do what it naturally wants to do, which is regenerate that bone. Now, osteopore is now in the market. So osteopore is a uh, quite advanced. As I mentioned, this, this technology has been developed over some 20 years through research in Singapore. We are at the stage now where we are in the market where a company is generating revenue. So we're currently... Did, uh, company generated revenue of over a million dollars in calendar year 2019. And these products have been used and are past that. Uh, these are not development products. These are products that are in the market now. The products have FDA approval. They have CE mark clearance. They have regulatory approval around uh, key markets that, around the globe. We have secured Australian TGA approval. So we are primed and able to sell into these markets 
and the products have been used. So this is another key aspect of the technology that this is not a development uh, technology, but something that is really well established. We have over 30 years, uh, 30,000 rather, surgical procedures that have been used, that have been successfully completed using this Osteo4 technology. The, key, the company floated on ASX in uh, late 2019, has been very well supported by the ASX market since then, and of using the, and in the process of using the funds generated in the IPO for an aggressive global growth strategy involving taking the product out of the, the, the key Asian markets where the majority of the company's revenue has been generated and really developing new revenue streams and new geographic markets for the commercialization of the technology. At a corporate level, the company is very structured, very simple. Um, Osteopore Limited, the ASX listed company, we have about 100 million shares on issue. Currently trading in the sort of the mid 60s, about 65, 66 cents. It closed yesterday, gives us a market capitalization of some $65 million, $67 million and an enterprise value of about 67. The company still has some two and a, had two and a half million dollars in cash as of the end of uh, the March quarter. Our, um, our June quarter, uh, June quarter cash flow numbers will be released to the market in the near future, and that will provide not only the the cash balance but also the the revenue performance for the company over the uh, the last three months and the other operational updates. And I uh, urge everyone to to keep their eyes open for that uh, quarterly announcement that'll be coming to the market shortly. The company has no debt. We have a very tight capital structure, which uh, with the top 20 shareholders holding some 77% of the issued capital. And I will note as well, there are some 40 million shares that are still under escrow from the IPO. And that mainly relates to the early stage sort of founder um, investors and some of the people who've been involved in the Osteopore technology uh, for a long time um, and who were issued shares as part of the acquisition of the Singaporean entity that has previously been commercializing the technology. So it's a very tight capital structure. It's one that we see uh, very extreme movements when the volume starts coming in. And we've, uh, we've seen that a couple of times over the last month or so. If I look at our board and management, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Mr. Brett Sandercock as our non-executive chairman. Brett is currently the CFO of ResMed. Uh, a company that I'm sure everyone would be very familiar with, one of the largest uh, medical device companies on the ASX. And Brett has been uh, invaluable in his assistance at board level in, in helping the company build relationships and also being aware of uh, the, the, the sorts of issues and uh, the ways of addressing those issues as medical device companies grow um, and, and develop their global market opportunity. So, Brett's experience from some 15 years in ResMed is invaluable. Um, he's a, a, a fantastic guy to work with and um, we could be luckier to have someone of his calibre to, uh, to lead our board. Um, also on the board, we have Professor Teo Sui Hin, who is the original founder of the technology, one of the world's leading experts in tissue engineering um, and uh, uh, biomechanical induction. Um, he is a professor of uh, bioengineering at Nanyang Technical University up in Singapore and is the original founder of the, uh, the, research, uh, the, the research themes that led to the osteopore technology and one of the original founders and in, um, of, the, of the company as well. Uh, also on the board, Mr. Stuart Carmichael. Um, Stuart is a uh, corporate advisor based here in Perth. Uh, with a lot of experience in the ASX, and he was really the, 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 the key person responsible for identifying the osteopore technology and the opportunity that that, that, uh, that technology and the company would have in an ASX environment. We're also very lucky to have Mr. Kun, uh, Kun Seng Go as the CEO of the company based up in Singapore. Kun Seng has over 30 years experience in the medical device industry um, has worked with some of the largest medical device companies in the world, Medtronic and Edwards Life Sciences, as well as working in a number of smaller companies. So it's very hands-on, uh, has seen it, seen it all, done it all, and is, uh, has really been responsible for the, the, the transformation of osteopore over the last four or five years from a very university-focused, sort of research-focused uh, technology company to a commercialization entity that is really aggressively growing its revenue and its market penetration. 
My background is, uh, is uh, as an executive director of the company, my primary responsibility is to manage the ASX side of the business and the investor relations. My background is I've spent the last 20 years working in a number of uh, environments where focusing on the ASX and technology commercialization uh, and how technology commercialization companies like Osteocore can access funding through the ASX, but also on how they can build value um, on the ASX platform and build, d deliver uh, capital growth and uh, returns to shareholders. Before, um, before Osteocore, I was the managing director of Hazer Group and one of the founders of that business, which floated on ASX in uh, about five years ago, and I was the managing director of that for a couple of years post-listing. So we talk a bit about the business model that Osteopore has. We are a very much a manufacturer. We, uh, we see the, the manufacturing of these devices as being the core part of what we can do. It's not capital intensive, and this is the commercial advantages that 3D printing brings us, that uh, 3D printing based manufacturing, it's not as capital intensive as traditional manufacturing. Um, you also have a lot of flexibility in terms of the way that you deploy manufacturing assets, but also you have a lot of flexibility and can customize products as required. So in addition to standard products, um, Osteopore is able to produce patient specific customized implants as a result of the 3D technology, uh, 3D printing technology that, um, that Osteopore is built. on. There's also some IP advantages associated with the manufacturing business model. Um, a lot of the manufacturing processes and techniques used in the creation of the osteopore products is proprietary and protected by trade secret. Um, polycaprolactone, the polymer that is, um, the osteopore scaffold is made of, is not an easy material to 3D print. And so there's a lot of soft IP and know-how associated with the manufacturing. And as a result, we, we as a company are very keen to ensure that we maintain control over that. We keep that in-house. And we use distributors. So the typical model for us is that we will manufacture product. We will then sell it as a wholesale rate to a distributor. And then that distributor will have regional um, territories that they will then develop and, uh, and sell the market, sell to hospitals and, uh, and surgeons. We like that business model because the, from our perspective, the manufacturing is not capital intensive, whereas the distribution is actually quite capital intensive, not so much in in hard assets, but certainly in human capital in terms of maintaining not only a sales force, but also all of the, the customer side technical support and product support that the distributors provide. So we see ourselves as a manufacturer and a seller at wholesale rates. We operate at very solid margins, some 80, 85% gross margin at a, at a wholesale um, price point. So we see that as being a very high margin aspect of the business and one that we're keen to build that distribution network globally. We will be looking in the future to expand our manufacturing capability. We have expanded manufacturing capability on the, pro, um, with, on the um, using the res, uh, proceeds of the IPO, but we are also at the moment currently doing all our manufacturing up in Singapore, and we will be looking at diversifying that manufacturing base and establishing new manufacturing centers as we build the business and we build the revenue into these other, into other new markets. Since IPO, we have seen significant revenue growth. So the uh, um, 2019 um, and, and first quarter of 2020, we're seeing very solid uh, revenue growth compared to the previous corresponding period. Q1 of 2020 is possibly the, it was a highlight with sales some 60% higher than the previous corresponding period. Uh, Q1 sales are something of a, uh, a, a down period for the company just due to the current geographic spread of, the, um, of our sales, very focused on Asia. And that first quarter is very affected by the Chinese New Year, Lunar New Year celebration. So we, we do see that as being a quiet month, but nevertheless, Q1 2020, we were some 60% above the previous corresponding period. Um, and you can see on the, the, the right-hand side, the, the sales growth of the company over since about 2016, when Kun Sen came on board as CEO, um, up to revenue calendar last year of approximately 1.1 million Australian dollars. So very significant revenue growth over time. And with that set to further expand now that we have got IPO capital available to assist in our business development. 
In addition to the revenue growth, we have achieved a number of key strategic milestones since our IPO. And the most significant of that was our first US distribution agreement that was announced at the beginning of July. Um, it was very well received by the market and uh, is a, a real milestone for the company's development and being able to penetrate what is the largest single geographic market for the company's products being the US market. We've also gained TGI approval to assist us in market entry into Australia. We've established a partnership to get market entry into the Chinese market. We've had some significant um, success with the orthopedic procedures. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the, the, the company focus and, and uh, therapeutic focus, which has to date primarily been craniofacial, so the head and the skull type surgeries. But we have seen significant progress and, uh, and success in orthopedic long bone uh, procedures. And we've been continuing to build the team and building the manufacturing capability to drive our further revenue growth. So a number of strategic milestones have been achieved since IPO, with at the same time having seen uh, significant revenue growth um, with, with access to the IPO funds from the existing uh, geographic markets. The US distribution agreement we signed uh, beginning of July with a company called Bioplate. It's an established market leader in neurosurgery. So again, with that focus on cranial uh, skull and uh, cranio, um, craniofacial surgery, it has very strong sales presence and the, we have signed a, a, a non-exclusive distribution agreement with them to cover some of the key markets where Bioplate has strong sales presences, particular California and Texas, but also Wyoming, Ohio, Arizona, Indiana, and Puerto Rico. Um, Bioplate covers all of the, the technical and support requirements for, those, for that US market, which is critical for a company like Osteo4, as I mentioned, that human capital requirement um, to be able to service and provide that customer side support is, uh, is very intensive and would be very onerous obligation for us in Osteoport as a small company based out of Singapore and Australia to cover that US market. So we see, that as a, we see this as a really strong agreement, uh, one that we see as having real potential to deliver significant sort of step change revenue growth for the company in the, in the years to come. So we look at the osteopause business development plan and we really see it in three phases. Phase one is all about revenue expansion. We look to increase the market penetration of the product in the markets that we already are in. And at the same time, building new geographic markets to access new markets that we haven't been generating revenue from in the past. And so we've really been doing that. We've built that underlying revenue base from the Asian markets. We've obtained the necessary regulatory approvals in particular for the Australian market. We've continued to invest in sales and, and marketing, and we've been enhancing that business development activity with new distribution agreements and uh, new opportunities in key markets. So we're really on good track to do that, that core phase one, building that underlying revenue base. And that takes us then into the phase two of our business development, which is really around new therapeutic segments. As I mentioned at the moment, all of our products are very much focused above the shoulders and primarily above the nose to be pretty specific. We're really focused on, have been focused on that cranial surgery, maxillofacial, um, neurosurgery type markets. There are massive opportunities for the company in both the dental space and also in the orthopedic space. So dental, we see a huge amount of demand for assistance in re uh, regenerative uh, regeneration of bone uh, associated with dental implants, so providing stronger foundations for uh, dental implants that are being inserted when people are losing teeth. Um, Osteopore has seen some clinical success and cl clinically demonstrated that we are able to regrow bone in that part of the body, um, and we are undertaking clinical trials necessary to get further regulatory approval in that space. And the other, the other big opportunity for us is in the orthopedic, the long bone segments, where we have had seen significant success and uh, I'd refer people to uh, some of the news flow that we saw in the, in the company in the late, latter part of last year with a gentleman on the Gold Coast um, who had 36 centimetres of his tibia uh, uh, damaged due to a, uh, an infection, a bone infection, my osteomyelitis. Um, and he was looking at an above the knee uh, amputation uh, and prosthetic as his only possible uh, alternative when, uh, other than the osteopore technology. 
The osteopore scaffold was used to regenerate 36 centimetres of tibia. That's effectively his entire shin bone was regenerated in late last year after two years of recovery. Um, that patient, Ruben, was able to walk without crutches. So it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity when we start looking at these long bone and orthopedic procedures and what can be done there. So again, we've completed the preclinical pre trials. We are in a position where we are able to do some of these procedures on a trial basis as order to get the, um, the, the clinical data necessary for regulatory approval. The phase three of the blue sky in this is then to look at what, can, what else can we do? Can we accelerate bone regeneration? Can we put additional um, additives into the polymer matrix to, that would uh, uh, further assist regeneration? Would we be able to look at other tissue types? We've talked about bone a lot as being a regenerative tissue type, but there are other tissues where this sort of uh, augmentation and, uh, and facilitation of natural regeneration could be very appropriate and could deliver very, very significant therapeutic advantages. And we have opportunities in veterinary markets. We know that our products work in other, in other animals. We do animal trials as part of preclinical work. So the question of what the veterinary market may look like remains to be seen. But even outside of the veterinary market, it's worth noting these markets are huge. They are multi-billion dollar global markets. Um, the, 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 the pie chart in the middle there gives a sort of breakdown. We're primarily focused on that orange segment at the moment. So that represents probably only in the order of about 20, 15 to 20% of the global market. As we expand into new global markets, that market will increase significantly. But already we are in, in over a billion dollars worth of markets at the moment. So we have huge opportunities to grow this um, as we penetrate into the craniomaxillofacial market, then as we move into the dental markets, cosmetic markets, and finally the orthopedic and spinal markets, we're looking at some four or five billion dollar market in uh, bone graft substitutes, plus another hundred billion dollar market, which is the permanent implant market. So our commercial priorities from here are, 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 are set out on the, on the final slide here, really looking at, at building, educating and assisting our, our distribution partners uh, to get better sales penetration, continuing to build that revenue stream and that we can report that on a, on a quarterly basis, continuing to build that penetration into new markets in the US, in the EU and in Australia and Asia. Continue to move into new US territories. As I mentioned, we're really focusing at the moment on, on only some seven territories in the US. So there's opportunities for us to, to secure additional distributors that have better um, and that have good distribution networks into some of those key markets on the, uh, on the eastern seaboard in the, the Floridas and uh, Boston and New York markets. Our China strategy is developing. There's uh, already, we have a, an, an MOU into southern China to assist us getting into uh, a key Chinese market, but we're continuing to expand our China strategy and continuing to develop, to, to develop that opportunity and continuing to move on our product scope. And as we will see continued news flow around our clinical trials and some of the other uh, successes that we've been able to generate outside of the, uh, outside of the uh, cranial space. And we see the opportunities for rewriting in the market at the moment. Um, if you look at the, the, the market for um, regenerative uh, medical devices, we look at these companies as sort of what we see as aspirational peers, companies like Polynovo, Mesoblast and Aveda. We see that opportunity for re-rating as companies generating around five to 10 million US dollar equivalent uh, revenue streams. And we start seeing these companies valued at over a billion dollars. So we see a real opportunity for as Osteopore will continue to grow its revenue streams to be successful, to be uh, significantly re-rated by the market from our current market cap of some 50, $60 million up into set potentially several, uh, several orders of magnitude, an order of magnitude or several times what that valuation would be as those revenues start to come through. So if I can finish off on the investment highlights, just why is it that we see Osteopore as such a, uh, a, a, an opportunity in the current market conditions? We are generating revenue. We do have the regulatory clearances to penetrate into um, into those key markets. We have a proven and scalable business model. We have proprietary technology through grant and patents as well as our knowledge and IP. We have an extremely well-credentialed team at operational and at board level. And as we've seen, the potential for very significant re-rating by the capital markets 
as we continue to execute our business plan. Any further information, please feel free to reach out to myself or to Kun Sengo, our, uh, our CEO up in Singapore. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for the very extensive uh, presentation. We've kind of used up our half an hour, so unfortunately I can't get to the one or uh, to the couple of questions that come through. But if I can just do maybe one or two very quickly, because I know Ben is yeah. waiting to, to jump That's on here. Um, one is, how long does it actually take to print one of these things? Is it an hour, five hours, and how custom, customizable to the patient is it? Um, okay, so the, 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 the units that we, the, the products, they can be anything from an hour to a day to print, depending on the complexity and the, the degree of customization. So a small plug um, or a small standard product might, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll print, um, you know, a plate of a dozen of those in a few hours. So it'll be a single plate uh, about the size of an A4 sheet of paper. You might get a dozen small plugs that would be printed on that and that would all be done over a course of a couple of hours. Um, a more complicated customized piece could be 12, 24 hours or more. So, you know, the the scaffold that was printed for Ruben for his uh, for the tibia reconstruction, which is one of the, probably the more probably one of, if not the most complicated and uh, extensive pieces that's been uh, produced, that would have been, uh, you know, tens of hours of, uh, of printing, of producing that scaffold to be exactly what the surgeons required to cover that sort of complex piece. Um, another, other standard, other customized pieces that could be like for a skull, they would still be, you know, potentially eight to 12 hours of printing time. So there's quite a, a significant amount of time going into making sure that the printing is done, that it's done and, and it's uh, the, the pore structure in particular is very important. So it's important to get those things right and get the, the, that accuracy in the printing as it comes through. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeff. We're going to have to leave it there. If anybody's any questions, um, Jeff's details are on his final slide there. Um, Jeff, if you could stop sharing your screen uh, currently and then I think yep. we have Ben, are you ready to go? I am, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, great. If you can start sharing your screen now, Ben, and I'll let you know when I can see the, the first slide of your presentation. Um, yeah, I can see your cover slide now, Ben, so you're ready to go. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. And uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. And thanks, everyone, for, for listening in. Um, Wide Open Agriculture is Australia's leading regenerative food and agriculture company. Um, you've just heard Jeff use the word regenerative uh, in relation to osteopore, and indeed that, that word is a, is a word that's central to our organisation. Um, it really is uh, a movement in, in food and agriculture that we identified over five and a half years ago, and now we really are at, at, the, at the crest of the wave um, in, this, in this sector. The company, um, the relevance of regenerative, it, it really does allow uh, a food production system that in fact, I could argue that organic strives to achieve. It, it, it allows you to um, continually improve your farming system, um, but also offer the type of food that an overwhelming group of consumers are now looking for. Food that is um, offering them both health and nutrition and aligning to their values around systems that protect the farmland and are also fair to the farmer. It's, it's not something that's um, niche anymore. Um, we've seen companies as large as General Mills and Danone in the top five food sec uh, companies in the world, recognizing and identifying regenerative as a very important part of their, their growth strategy. And indeed, um, Amazon purchased Whole Foods, a very large health and wellness a retail chain a few years ago and, and Whole Foods is one of the largest retailers um, of healthy, nutritious food in, in America. And, and they identified regenerative as the number one food trend for 2020. So we're really excited to be a part of this, you know, absolute sort of global movement in regenerative and to be at the forefront of it here in Australia. And I think we all recognize um, with COVID-19 um, affecting all of our lives and in fact, globally, ever more so the, the recognition of the value of eating healthy, nutritious food, uh, both for yourself and, and for your family has become ever more present. And you'll see in our, in our sales results, 
we've really, um, like a lot of online and the health and wellness food sector, we really are very well positioned in this, in this new environment that we all live in with COVID-19. Moving to the structure of the company, uh, we also have a very tight registry. Um, we recently did a, a capital raise um, that brought in and continued sh to show the loyalty of our, of our largest shareholder. They indeed retained their, their position in the, in the recent capital raise. And we also brought in um, additional, very loyal and, and committed shareholders. We've always been very um, careful to articulate our, our position as a company committed to these regenerative practices and, and values. And with that, we've brought um, very loyal shareholder base. We also have a foundation in our, in our top two and myself and the other co-founder, Anthony Maslin, um, alongside the foundation and the family office hold almost 40% of the company. We've been really um, happy to, to sort of be able to manage the, the COVID situation very positively. And we're absolutely committed to optimizing and, and protecting our cash as best as we can um, to get through what is you know, quite still unpredictable conditions, but we're really showing the capacity to do that over the last two quarters. So our, our business model is quite simple, really. Um, it's bringing the best of West Australian uh, produce to, to Australian and also most importantly, uh, in our growth strategy, Southeast Asian and, and larger global markets. We, we call it a grow, diversify and innovate strategy. Our, our core business, as you'll see, is our ethical meat business, grass-fed beef and regenerative lamb. We're diversifying into very exciting um, category, um, oat, oat milk, which is, I'll explain more, a very, very exciting category uh, in regards to both consumer trend and on-brand sort of um, excitement. And then the innovation, the, the plant-based protein, our, our lupin technology, our proprietary technology, another very large and very rapidly growing sector. Um, so what excites us is that we sit both in animal-based and plant-based products. We see that as very important um, part of our strategy, but also recognizing that we sit in categories that align to people's changing habits in how they eat. Yes, people are eating, or in Australia at least, and other developed countries are choosing to eat less meat, but when they choose meat, they definitely choose ethical um, meat and products and meat products that align to their values and, and nutritional expectations, but they are also transitioning to more uh, plant-based foods. How we convey our story is, is through what is now our um, really well-recognized brand here in the West Australian market, it's dirty, clean food. Essentially, dirty is about healthy soil. Healthy, luscious um, soil produces vibrant, nutritious food. Clean is about no hidden nasties. We, we have an absolute commitment to conveying and, and expressing in our packaging and in our online strategies how we produce our food and ensuring there are no chemical residues, um, either of the pesticide or herbicide class, but also the way that we use um, biological fertilizers over the more traditional um, deep um, ureas and um, nitrogen-based fertilizers. And it's food that really is intended to, to grow you a better world. So this brand is now proven and tested in, in what is a very sophisticated food market, West Australia. Um, we, we have some of um, Australia's leading chefs over here and we've managed to penetrate 55 uh, premium restaurants here in West Australia and have very good relationships with restaurants as sort of far, far afield as um, the, the Crown Casino's Rockpool, um, and then down to Dunsborough, the Cape Lodges of the world, that really, uh, with Tony Howe, a very good chef there, who really understands not only the importance of quality, it's always about quality and consistency in that quality, but also the story that sits behind the food. They really understand the value that that brings to, to, to their offering to customers. With Alongside those 55 restaurants, we've now in over 30 independent uh, supermarkets, the retailers are very excited to have a dynamic brand on their shelf, the colouring, the imagery. They're, they're excited to sort of be a part of what they see as sort of a, a sort of a more aligned value proposition for, for a younger demographic of eaters that are looking for, for meat that aligns to their values. But also our online business, you'll see, has really dramatically grown um, almost, uh, almost to a five-fold extent uh, during the, um, in response to the COVID where people were looking for online home delivery and indeed online groceries are incredibly 
exciting category globally now where people are looking to get the best of food brought to their door and that's exactly what Dirty Clean Food offers to consumers here in West Australia. So we've experienced very exciting revenue growth um, over, you know, I think we can all recognise very challenging times. Um, the last quarter, our quarterly has been released now to the ASX, so I can speak to these numbers. Um, we, we saw over 49% um, growth um, over the last quarter. And what's exciting is that we actually lost um, in the middle of March uh, when they closed all the restaurants here in West Australia. We lost, in fact, 40% of our market. But what happened was the online market completely absorbed all of that loss. And what we're excited by is that our strategy was set out always to be one of diversity, uh, both in product categories, as you've seen, the, the meat, the oat and lupin, but also in marketing channels as well. So being across online retail and food service is very exciting. And also another exciting category that we're really starting to push deeper into, and some of these clients are pushing into our top 10 accounts, are, are the food kits. So the, the dinner twists and the My Foodie boxes in, in Western Australia, in, in Sydney and Melbourne, I know Marley Spoon's a very big one. These, these types of companies are really looking for a provenance story now. So we see them as exciting partnerships going forward um, into, this, into this next quarter. Also, yes, we are very much only in West Australia now. And what we see is exciting about that is that to launch into Asia, you have to have a solid base. They, the first thing people do is look at your social media, look at your reputation in your home market. And what we've done is really achieved that. West Australia is now um, a very exciting market for us. Uh, we, we have real reputation here. And we also see a lot of opportunity for us to take our brand and our opportunities across to those Eastern seaboard markets as well, which obviously are just larger markets. I'll talk now about our most exciting project, the one with the greatest growth and scale, which is the, the plant-based protein. In West Australia, we grow 60% of um, global production of Australian sweet lupin. Uh, Australian sweet lupin is in, a, in effect one of the, the best superfoods that is kind of unexplored for human consumption right now. So it's got one of the highest protein levels and one of the lowest anti-nutritional levels of any legume in the world. So that means that when you eat lupin, um, all of the protein in it is effectively absorbed by your body. But right now, as it stands, um, of the almost 700,000 tonnes that West Australia produces, only 6% um, goes into human consumption. And we recognise that very early on as, as an important crop. And we've worked very hard to um, identify technology and we now have a global exclusive license of proprietary technology that was developed by Curtin University here in West Australia that unlocks the lupin, um, that really allows it to create a, a 3D functional um, molecule, molecule that allows it to bond and connect to other particles in the food. Effectively, it's um, making the difference between uh, a legume that if you added it now, uh, a standard um, lupin grain into a glass of water, it would, it would drop to the bottom and it would be like sand. And, and that's been one of the challenges of getting lupin into, into human consumption is that it just doesn't bind with other elements in, in the food matrix. So it became, it's quite gritty and, it's, and the taste is quite, it's quite bitter. This technology solves both of those problems by creating this 3D functional molecule that can bind. It's soluble and, and it gels, which is very exciting from a food technician's point of view. But also it, it eliminates um, some of the bitterness and really uh, the, the results are it tastes effectively like soy, a very, a very neutral flavour. And that's exactly what you're looking for and exactly what companies uh, that are presented here on this slide, like the Nestle's and the Kellogg's of this world, there is a global scramble uh, for alternatives to the soy uh, market that offer environmental credentials. And that's exactly where um, loop and protein will sit. Um, the, real, the real market darling of last year, Beyond Meat, is an example of just how much interest there is in the plant-based plant -based protein market. And uh, we really see this loop and protein as being a really exciting new entrance to the market. So where we are now is effectively we have this uh, global exclusive license. We have CSIRO's Food Innovation Lab uh, right now putting the equipment based on the, the benchtop scale into the pilot scale. Um, they're lining up the equipment um, and in September we will start that process where we will create a, a food grade commercial quantity 
We then create samples and information on this, which we then send both to our internal lab under Dirty Clean Food. We can create our own products directly through this uh, lupin protein, but also we can offer it um, to, to the Nestle's, the Kellogg's of this world as a specialty ingredient as well. So we see really exciting um, opportunities, both internally and, and as a specialty ingredient. Moving now to our oat products or our oat milk. Um, if, if you've been um, to cafes recently, um, plant-based milks are really surging into the dairy category. They, they now captured almost 17% of, of the dairy market. And actually oat milk is the rising star in plant-based milks. Predominantly soy and almond have dominated. Uh, talk to any barista, look at any market research. It is um, the oat milk that is going to be the leader. What, why? Because it's got a very neutral taste. Um, it frosts very well, so baristas love it. Um, a lot of people are choosing plant-based milks because of that sort of um, lack of uh, lactose and the sort of bloaty feel, but also its environmental credentials. And oat milk is right at the top uh, in regards to environmental credentials when lined up against its main rivals, which are soy and almond. What we've achieved effectively is we've taken West Australia's reputation for being one of the, one of the best oat growers in the world and converted it into a value-added product. Um, our, our second market trials just came through. We've, we've sent them to retailers, baristas and distributors in WA and had very, very high praise and a lot of excitement uh, about the launch. And we're right on track to launch that product into West Australian markets. We, we're speaking to a couple of distributors and getting some really strong interest and also East Coast distributors as well. The market leader, Oatly, um, produces a, a great product and we've been doing blind market testing, getting very strong responses that ours rivals Oatly in taste and for the barista's frothability. So we're really excited to launch what is gonna be a very strong provenance story of West Australian regenerative oat milk into WA, East Coast, and, and then um, conversations with Singaporean based distributors have commenced as well. So those markets um, above us are, are really exciting potential. Our core business right now is our ethical meat. Um, so the grass fed beef and regenerative lamb has been a really exciting way for us to launch dirty clean food into the market. The online strategy, as I mentioned earlier, really ramped up uh, during the COVID um, sort of response phase and has allowed us to, to bring in um, external or what we call Dirty Clean Foods Friends um, suppliers from um, as far afield as Sustainable Fish, uh, from an ethical milk company, Bannister Downs, based here in West Australia. We have bread and now we're making family meals as well with some of our local cafes. So what that's allowed us to do is create a digital platform that can not only be replicated and scaled here in West Australia, but we can apply uh, in different markets and contexts. And that's one of our growth strategies that we're looking at very closely. So to our growth strategies, um, now that we have very secure supply and very strong relationships with our, with our farmers, um, we know we are ready to scale, particularly in that growth category, the, the grass-fed beef and the regenerative lamb. We see a lot of potential there to bring um, to domestic uh, national retailers a story and value proposition of both quality uh, and, and also brand uh, in, in both the lamb and, and the grass-fed beef category. Having a strong proven brand, Dirty Clean Food, is absolutely vital. So we want to build that and we're, we're looking and discussing with a couple of parties over on the East Coast to see how that model could be replicated in, in both Sydney and Melbourne. And that digital platform, it's all there. Our logistics and efficiencies are, are really strong. Uh, we, we've really worked to make sure our gross margins in our digital category remain and strive to stick to 23%. Um, we've recognised that that multi-channel strategy is, is so exciting and important to us. But the real innovation there is this lupin-based protein. Um, moving that to this exciting phase where we have a commercial grade, uh, food grade sample that we can then offer um, to global food companies um, with a untapped resource here in West Australia, 60% of the world's production sitting on our doorstep. Uh, we really see that as being something that really elevates the company into a $300 million company over the next five years alongside our, our proven markets with our grass-fed beef and lamb, and is the launch of the oat milk. That's gonna be a very exciting news flow for us 
Um, the packaging is very exciting and vibrant and dynamic. It captures our brand aspirations really well. So we see that as really exciting short-term progress as well. The board, the, the co-founders were myself, Anthony Maslin and Stuart McAlpine. Uh, Anthony brings a, a realm of expertise in, in capital markets and finance and Stuart's um, a proven regenerative farmer. Elizabeth and Ronnie, um, as we've strived and proven our, our brand, bring a wealth of experience in um, both brand and strategic positioning and also export and distribution markets into China. So we're really excited to have them on the board and they've brought a, a real sort of um, real push into the, into the branding and marketing for wide open agriculture. And then the management team really, it's, it's a wealth of experience from, from Jay Albany, who's built a $30 million direct to consumer food business in, in Manhattan, to Tim White, who was a, a, a key um, operations manager at Ingham's Chickens, a very large integrated food business, to, to Marilyn Nelson, who was the woman who brought Mrs. Max Pies really into every super, super um, re um, service station in Australia um, and, and has got proven marketing expertise. The backup team around operations, corporate development and carbon neutrality are very strong and passionate. And I think that's a real asset to, to our execution of what is a very exciting strategy. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. I welcome your questions, but really we're in a, we're in a massive sector. Um, we're positioned right there at the forefront of it uh, across a diversified product range. And we really are excited uh, over the next 12 months. It's going to be a very exciting period for us and uh, looking forward to, to that development. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ben. Yeah, we've got we've got a couple of questions. Um, the first one, I think, you, I think you kind of answered it, but if we could just go back over it. Um, how does Lupin compare to the seven billion dollar soy market? Um, you know, what are its major competitive advantages? Um, you know, switching between soy to Lupin. Yeah. No, thanks, Mark. Um, the soy, the soy market really dominates right now the plant-based protein market. If, if you look at beyond beyond meat, impossible foods, and other replica, other sort of meat replicas, soy is generally um, the predominant um, key product. The, the challenges with soy is it's predominantly being pushed into a GMO market. So that alignment with people's perceptions and attitudes towards GMOs um, uh, makes it sort of challenging, and also the phytoestrogen issue. It's, it's generally used as quite a, a heavy input system. So a lot of chemicals and pesticides are used in the production of soy and it's, it's heavy on water use as well. Um, so those elements of soy have really got companies looking for more environmentally credentialed um, plant-based proteins. And that's where Australian sweet lupin is so exciting in that it's, it's non-GMO. It has very low, low GI values as well. And I mentioned those anti-nutritionals early as well. That's actually something that's very exciting from, from health and nutritionist angles. It means that when you eat lupin, everything you consume um, is actually absorbed as a, as a healthy protein into your diet. And, and then the actual production of lupin, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a rain fed system. It's, it's very tolerant to, to low rain conditions. In fact, the Northern and Eastern wheat belt of West Australia is where it's predominantly grown. And it's a relatively low chemical input system as well. It's, it's a legume, so it's putting nitrogen back into the soil. So very important in regenerative systems to have that. So we really, our intent is to really market it and produce a plant-based protein that really has the highest environmental credentials. So the beyond meats of this world, when they look at it, they see it as an opportunity for both their marketing and offering to, to what is very important value proposition to their customers. And then one question here, Ben, what people asking the difference between uh, regenerative permaculture, biodynamic, are they interchangeable words for uh, the same thing or is there, you know, kind of stark differences between the, the three? I think I would describe it as there's a spectrum um, and, and regenerative is, is quite an umbrella term that captures them. Certainly permaculture and biodynamic uh, are regenerative systems. But the way we measure internally, we have our internal metrics for regenerative is we have production protocols. They're our non-negotiables. So they're about, for example, grass-fed beef, no antibiotics, no hormones, 100% grass-fed, and the animals always have a right to roam. And then beyond that, we have a system where we, we work with our farmers to measure what are they doing in relation to soil health, 
to biodiversity or protecting um, existing vegetation on their farm and also ensuring a very secure water cycle as well. So ensuring the water that enters the farm leaves the farm at, at, the, at the same level of quality. So they're, they're, they're different, biodynamic and, and permaculture, but regenerative is something that allows us to really show and connect to, to consumers as much to farmers that there is continual improvement on farm. Yeah, great. And then another question, uh, how does lupin compare to whey protein? Well, whey, whey is dairy, so it's, it's not plant-based. So that's the, the main predominant difference. Whey is another, another area that we think um, plant, uh, lupin-based protein will be able to compete with. Um, so, yeah, we think there's a general push away from, from animal-based proteins. And really when people are choosing things like the Beyond Meats, they're choosing it generally to um, either reduce or eliminate their, their meat intake. So that's where lupin really fits nicely into that bracket. And then, yeah, just on Beyond Meat and you mentioned possible foods as well. I mean, are they a threat if they launch in Australia to the meat business? But on the flip side, could they be uh, a customer on, on the plant-based side? Yeah, I mean, we, we would, yeah. To answer the first part of the question, we think there's always going to be red meat eaters. Um, I guess, yeah, in my own family, my wife is a vegetarian. I, I and my sons are committed red meat eaters. But actually, when we eat red meat, of course, we only eat dirty, clean food because it aligns to our values and, and the quality and nutritional values are there. And, and I think that's a, that's a dynamic that's going to play out across families and homes across Australia and globally. So I think the Beyond Meats recognise that and they, they talk about um, targeting flexitarians, people who are continuing to eat red meat but are perhaps changing one, one or two meals of red meat per week into a plant-based meal. So, no, we don't see them as a great threat, them entering. And yes, absolutely, we see them as potential customers. They're, they're on our customer list that will be getting uh, a sample of, of our um, loop and protein alongside uh, the Nestle's and the Kellogg's. There's, there's a very large appetite out there of um, food ingredient companies along with consumer brands that are really scrambling to find alternatives to, to the soys and whey's uh, and pea proteins out there. So that's why we're so excited about the potential for, for the lupin protein. And then a question then on um, East Coast ex expansion. Um, can you supply um, fresh direct from, from WA or do you, will it require getting farmers on board in country New South Wales or, or country Victoria? Yeah, in, in our discussions with um, East Coast um, you know, parties, we recognise that a lot of our value um, proposition is around um, short supply chains. So we actually have an MOU uh, with, a, with a really good grass-fed beef producer um, over in New South Wales. So it would actually, we believe, yeah, and looking at the sort of the logistics and distribution, it would be about, certainly for, for the grass-fed uh, beef and lamb, it would be about working with local producers uh, in New South Wales and Victoria to then bring that into markets um, like Melbourne and Sydney. But of course, the shelf stable products, uh, the, the oat milk, uh, will definitely be coming straight across to the Eastern Seaboard when we have the right relationship with the right distributor. Okay, and I think you mentioned October 2020 for, or is the, is the planned launch day of oat milk? So, you yeah, know, that, is that, that just going into retail or will, you know, that be showing up at local cafes in WA and Sydney from the call it, you know, November time? Yeah, that, that's right. That's, that's what we, we're expecting. Um, everything's on, on track for that. Our, our oats are, are with our, our European manufacturer now. Um, we have our final packaging ready to go for final sign-off. So, um, yeah, bearing nothing major in global logistics, shipping logistics, um, that's, that's right on track. Um, and that's right. We're, we're aiming for an October launch in, in the West Australian market. We want to do, yeah, sort of keep it a little bit tight, a little sort of an exclusive launch with, with our key cafes and customers that we have a relationship with here. Um, and then we're really looking for distributors who have relationships with cafes and, and retailers to allow it to be sort of a, a launch across both of those important categories because people often see it in their cafe 
and then and then they want to purchase it uh, in their supermarket. So that's a I guess a proven proven sort of strategy for launching of plant based milk. So we want to replicate that where we can. Okay, uh, we've got one minute left. Uh, if I can squeeze in one last question, Ben. Um, it, how do you plan to commercialize the lupin protein? Um, do you come out with a finished product or would you also consider licensing the technology IP to, to manufacturers? Yeah, um, what we're examining is we, we right now, um, strategically, we believe there's a great opportunity for West Australia to actually manufacture it. Um, but that said, we're also very open to, to joint ventures and partnerships with, with parties that would want to operate that manufacturing facility. But our, our license is very well structured. Um, our global exclusive license is very well structured with Curtin University. We can sub-license it. And in fact, yeah, I've entered conversations with North American and European parties who are, uh, who are requesting, you know, can they get in line for, for a licensing agreement? So that's, that's sort of an exciting sort of two pathways for us. Um, I guess where we see um, the greatest gross margin in our, in our forecast is to be, um, to be a, a manufacturer here in West Australia that's really operating using that 60% um, of global production of sweet Australian lupin. But also we see opportunities to encourage more West Australian farmers to grow more lupins. And, and there's a real appetite for that because of course it, it does improve soil health. So yeah, it's, it's an exciting direction that we'll really have an answer to uh, in the next six to eight months. Okay, great. Ben, we're going to have to leave it there. There was one or two more questions, but we've unfortunately just run out of time. Um, if anybody has further questions, uh, is it best just to email you directly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, welcome. Okay. Yeah, my okay, number's so, there as well. Yeah. yeah, so Ben's number is there and his, his email address is there. With that, I would like to thank uh, our two presenters, Jeff uh, Pocock from Osteopore and Dr. Ben Cole from Wide Open Agriculture for this morning's uh, presentations. And I look forward to seeing you all here again for our next one, which is tentatively going to be the 13th of August. Um, right in the middle of reporting season and details of that will be announced on the Twitter page uh, in the next week or so. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and uh, wish you all a good day.